A huge crowd gathered in the rain Friday to mark an ominous day in American history. They stood outside the Memphis Motel where 40 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Do you remember that day? Not really. Um, uh, I don't know if I went into shock. I mean, my, my siblings always tell me stories about what took place and do you remember this? And I'm saying, no, I don't. Uh, I should have remembered some things at age five, but I just didn't. Bernice King is the youngest of Martin Luther King Jr.'s four children. She was five years old when her father was assassinated. This Pulitzer Prize winning photograph shows Bernice on her mother's lap during his funeral. I kind of wish I could go back and redo the whole story, you know, remove the assassination and restore uh, a home, a family. Bernice says her father was haunted by the possibility of being assassinated. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Especially after the murder of President John F. Kennedy. He remarked to my mother, because they were watching it on television, and she, he said, you know, that's what's going to happen to me. This is where it all started, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. King delivered some of his most influential sermons on civil rights from this church. And after his assassination, this is where King was brought for a final goodbye. I mean, there were throngs of people. There's, Just packed the streets? I mean, there was 150,000 people here that day. I have a dream today. That, of course, was Dr. King's landmark speech. And on the 40th anniversary of his death, his dream is very much alive as Senator Barack Obama vies to become America's first black president. Through his faith, his courage, and his wisdom, Dr. Martin Luther King moved an entire nation. America may be on the verge of electing its first black president. What might your father say about that possibility? I think he would say that the work that they did during the 50s and 60s uh, really laid um, an important foundation for this happening. This is part of the, the beginning of fulfilling the dream. It doesn't get any harder than this. Mourners saying goodbye to the young victims of the Columbine shooting. But as thousands paid their respects, Nearby, another funeral went almost unnoticed. One of the killers, Dylan Klebold, was quietly laid to rest at this church. A small service attended by only 15 friends and family. Well, Reverend all, Don Markshausen performed the service for Dylan's oh, distraught parents. Know. They just know their son, who they loved, was getting ready for college. And they even paid the money on Monday for his dorm fees. What kind of state are the parents in right now, the Klebolds in right now? There's the grief of, of the death of a child, which is the ultimate kind, I guess, loss. And then there's now, who was this child? And why did this happen? Both the Klebolds and the Harrises have been in seclusion since the massacre. But Dee Grant, Susan Klebold's hairdresser, saw her just days after the shooting. She had no idea her son She was... had no idea. I asked her if she had any idea. And uh, she did say, no, I did not want to pry. Grant says Dylan Klebold's mother is shocked by the description of her son as a neo-Nazi killer. She was upset that they were talking about all this prejudice. Um, she says, Dee, we never teach prejudice in our home. She says, Dee, I'm Jewish. The unforgettable events of last week have been just as tough for Dylan's dad, Thomas. In every death, there's a guilt. And this one, on Friday before, so we're talking past the week now, he thought he heard a stress tone in his son's voice. And he sort of made a mental note, he's got to go check that out or find out, or maybe, you know, over the weekend or next week, we'll find out what the, and then it kind of went by. Now he wishes. This is just as much a tragedy for them as the victims. I mean, all these good people have been victimized by this act. But today, some are saying that if the parents feel guilt, it's deserved. And Attorney General Janet Reno revealed that the parents are being scrutinized. Authorities are trying to determine what they knew. Colorado Governor Bill Owens had his own opinion. I haven't talked to the Jefferson County Sheriff personally, but I saw him, and he's a friend of mine, and I saw what he was saying yesterday, and that is that 
they found in one of the gunmen's homes um, clear evidence out sitting in the room of what was about to happen. And if that's true, I think that perhaps charges uh, will be filed and certainly should be filed. Even the father of Isaiah Scholes, one of the victims, has had little sympathy for the Harrises. I can't really say much for the other parents. Evidently, they didn't watch theirs because there's no way a bomb would be made in this garage, and I didn't know about it. Though today, law enforcement officials seem to be backing off, saying that the parents are not official suspects. What do you say to all the people now who are pointing the finger at the parents and saying, well, they should have known it's their responsibility? This is a man and a woman who love their children, who loves their son, especially Dylan right now, who thought they were doing the best they could to raise him, and the parents both wish they could take their son's place. 61-year-old Bill McVeigh is enjoying his early retirement years as best he can, doing the things he enjoys most, like working in his garden and chipping golf balls in the backyard. But it can't be easy losing himself in these simple pleasures, because McVeigh has lived much of the past six years in the eye of a hurricane. Bill's son, 33-year-old Timothy McVeigh, has been sentenced to death for the Oklahoma City bombing. Father Paul Belzer has been the McVeigh family priest for decades. Bill is quiet and uh, he stays by himself most of the time. And he seems to be calm when you talk with him. How's everything? Okay. Can we do anything? No. Inside Edition oh, spent an extensive amount of time with Bill McVeigh at his home. McVeigh won't be interviewed on camera. He's trying to live quietly, but it hasn't been easy. In our in-depth off-camera interviews, Bill told us that when he's visited his son in jail, Timothy has seemed like the same good-natured kid he's always known. Bill says he'll never understand how his son or anyone could do anything like what was done in Oklahoma. Dan Herbeck and Lou Michelle are the authors of American Terrorist. He is crestfallen by what happened in this bombing. When it first happened, he was astounded to hear that all these innocent people were killed. Can you turn that off, please? Would you talk to me? No. Can you turn that off, please? That's yeah, pretty much all Timothy's sister Jennifer had to say when we caught up with her near her new home, far from where she, her brother, and older sister Patty grew up outside of Buffalo, New York. Jennifer wants to be left alone. She was living in her family's hometown when her brother was arrested, and she's since moved far away, starting a new life as a middle school teacher. People may change superficially but not underneath. Elizabeth and John McDermott were close friends and next door neighbors of the McVeighs when both families were raising their children. We asked them how the horror of Oklahoma City has changed the father of America's worst terrorist. Externally, not tremendously, but I'm sure inside he's churning and churning and churning. This is where it all began, with the marriage of Bill and Mickey McVeigh in 1965, the marriage ended in 1984 when Tim was 16 years old. These are exclusive photos never before seen on television. They are portraits of a seemingly normal family. Mickey McVeigh, who attended her son's trial, declined an interview, but wrote us this emotional letter last year in which she describes life since the bombing. She says she's had to give up everything she had to start a new life, and says she's been harassed and treated as a nothing and that the family has been mocked and treated like criminals. But author Lou Michelle says Timothy McVeigh believes his arrest sent his mother into an emotional tailspin. With Timothy McVeigh's mother, it accelerated mental illness, McVeigh believes, and she has since been hospitalized involuntarily at three psychiatric facilities. And he believes that the pressures and being the mother of the Oklahoma City bomber accelerated her psychiatric problems. Two years ago, Mickey McVeigh created an uproar when she said it was time for survivors to get over their anger. She said she didn't mean to offend anyone, but many were. Anthony Cooper lost his grandson and daughter-in-law in Oklahoma. He'll never get over his loss. He doesn't blame the McVeigh family. He just wants Timothy McVeigh executed. Tim not only killed my family, but basically, he injured his own family to the point where they will be grieving for the rest of their lives also. I love Tim, and no, he's not evil. He 
took a very wrong turn and for whatever reason refuses to see the evil that he has done, but I don't think he is evil, no. And that's what makes the McVeigh story so hard to comprehend. You look at the photos of his youth, talk to the people who know him, who still love him, and you still can't trace the roots of the hate and violence. Bill McVeigh told us that he asked him in a jailhouse visit if he was ready to apologize to the families of the victims. Bill says Tim told him, Dad, I'd make a lot of people happy if I apologized, but if I apologized, I'd be lying. Are you prepared for death? I am. I came to terms with my mortality in the Gulf War. Uh, after that, it's not that hard to be, quote, prepared for death. Bill told Inside Edition that he and daughter Jennifer traveled to the prison in Indiana to visit Tim for the last time on April 10th. They were separated by a glass window. Bill says they could have had a final hug and kiss, but Tim said no. In the end, Bill says Timothy stood up, his hands cuffed behind him, turned, and pressed his open palms against the glass. Jennifer, in tears, pressed her hand against one of Tim's, and Bill did the same. Then Tim walked away. Bill McVeigh will never see his son again. There's nothing worse in the world than losing your own child, as these people did in Oklahoma City. But I think almost as horrific would be what Bill McVeigh went through. You're looking at the first incredible video from inside the New Orleans Superdome since the evacuation. We were the first camera crew allowed inside. Shafts of light from gaping holes in the roof illuminate the scene. Remnants of hell for up to 35,000 people. To get here involved an incredible journey through the abandoned city where the only traffic is army trucks. We waded through flood water that has become a toxic soup. As we come out of the flood waters, we kind of hit this ramp where, as you can see, there are personal belongings all along. This is where people camped out for days, waiting to be rescued. It's not pretty. Mountains of people's belongings left behind when they were rescued litter the landscape. I met Lieutenant Colonel Scott Elliott of the Texas Air National Guard, who told me the real heroes at the Superdome were the evacuees. The real action was the people. Um, what they put up with and, you know, the, the loss of their homes, um, people lost family members. As we enter the Superdome's dark, forbidding exactly. corridors, it's easy to see how families were separated, how there were reportedly rapes and sheer anarchy. The field itself looks like a battlefield, a sharp contrast with the palatial stadium which staged so many spectacular sports events over the years. Our guide inside the stadium is Airman Chris King. He's as overwhelmed as I am. The smell is absolutely overpowering. I mean, this is disgusting. Pretty indescribable, really. Uh, no, words, no words to describe it. Pretty awful. There's no electricity in this building. The only available light coming in from a few holes up in the ceiling. You can see a water cooler here with some empty drinks that people had in the first days. I mean, people ate here, they slept here, they went to the bathroom here. They had no choice, they had nowhere else to go. But it's absolutely disgusting and revolting to look at it and to smell it all these days later. Everywhere, there are poignant reminders of the loss and suffering. This is... Very sad to think that a little boy or a little girl's toy is left here in the seats. Probably something that gave them a lot of happiness in the days that they were left stranded in here. This little dog toy. When they uh, had the opportunity to leave, they probably just went out as quickly as they could. This is very sad to look at all this here. It's unbelievable to think that a little baby had to call this home. I mean, there is urine, human feces, and then you've got a baby carriage in the middle of all of this filth. Literally 10 seconds ago, some electricity, some power, finally came here into the Superdome. You can see that the concourse is now lit up. And it just illustrates even more clearly the unbelievable conditions that people were living in. 
We're going into the men's room. Oh, my God. Oh, guys, just get this room. Oh, my God. This is the most disgusting. Oh, I can't stay in here, guys. I cannot stay in here. This is the most revolting smell I've ever taken in my life. I finally went out onto the field itself. Water squishing underneath my feet. It was a surreal sight. There's probably an inch, two inches of water pretty evenly spread throughout this field. Unbelievable. Piles of garbage. Water bottles, garbage. Blankets. Open food packages. I don't think anyone ever imagined something like this could happen. We're at the 20 yard line in the Superdome. The 20 yard line in the Superdome and look at it. The air is thick. The smell is nauseating. I spent only a fraction of the time thousands of terrified people spent in here, but I couldn't wait to escape the suffocating atmosphere of this nightmarish place. This is the Lafon nursing home where 14 nursing home patients died. Another day, another nursing home nightmare in New Orleans. You can see where the water line got to. It's only about, uh, I'd say, uh, two feet. You can tell by looking at the markings here that no body was found inside of here. This is the name of the search team, CA-8. It was searched on September 9th. They found zero bodies in this room. Here we are, this is the uh, nursing station. A handwritten morgue sign, mud-stained pews in the chapel, beds and wheelchairs everywhere. There are reports that the patients who were left behind were brought upstairs, so I'm just gonna hazard a guess that we will see some numbers indicating a body count uh, upstairs. They found a body in here, you can tell. Number one. So presumably somebody died in this room. Whew. Oh, the smell in here is just brutal. Uh, it might be rotten food, I'm not sure. Oh boy, I'm not even gonna walk very far in here. They found two dead, clearly they found them right here in the hallway. Take a look at this, it's a pantry over here and there's actually, uh, there's actually food inside. There's uh, some evaporated milk, I see some sugar over here, some canned food, but I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't think this was a matter of people not having enough to survive. We are talking about elderly people who were infirm, who apparently could not fend for themselves, even with the provisions that were left here. You have to remember also that there was no power here. It was completely dark. These heartbreaking images come to you a day after we took an exclusive tour of the St. Rita's nursing home where 34 people died. Wow. This will give you an indication right here of just how high the water was. I'm five foot 11. There's the water line right there. We're talking about, uh, what, six feet, six, five, six foot five inches worth of water in here. Les Trant, he is with us from Inside Edition. Nancy Les Grace invited me on her CNN headline news show and was moved by our report. Can you imagine your grandmother in that? And remember this? Somebody's coming to get you on Tuesday. Somebody's coming to get you on Wednesday. Somebody's coming to it get you It was one of the most Thursday. riveting moments in the Hurricane Katrina coverage. A tearful account told by Jefferson Parish President Somebody Aaron Broussard on, on Meet the Press Somebody's on September 4th. Broussard talked about Somebody's a colleague whose mother was trapped Thursday. by the flood. Somebody's coming to get you on Friday and she drowned in Friday night. As it turns out, that woman was one of the 34 who died at St. Rita's. The owners of the nursing home have denied any wrongdoing. Meanwhile, this tragic story comes to light at the LaFon nursing home. One of the worst places to be during the height of the rioting here in Los Angeles was inside a commercial building, any building, but particularly inside a liquor store. And that's exactly where we are, in a liquor store. And Charles Jones is in his liquor store, and that's where he says he will stay until the rioting is completely over. Remember, her, we're not going to be here later, so make sure you, huh? you got what you need. Charles Jones opened his Compton area liquor store located deep inside the riot zone, knowing full well the danger. It was inescapable. It's been a long day. And it could get longer. 
Jones says his business was spared because he has respect and a good relationship with the very people in the area who were rioting. I was happy to see my place standing. But all around Jones's store, other businesses, large and small, weren't so lucky. We watched a stunned shop owner standing by helplessly, visibly shaken and unable to protect his clothing store. What can we do? Hey, hey, hey! We thought hey, being a black business owner was surviving, but I say, what can we do? I mean, how does it make you feel to be here seeing this happen? Oh! Well, it makes you mad naturally because you work hard to build something up. And, you know, your own people destroy it. So, excuse me, what, what do you think they're after? What is it that they're after? Just, at this point, I don't think anyone knows what they're after. I think that they're just caught up in the moment. Well, I understand the frustration, I'm sure, like everybody else, but, you know, this hurts. This, this really hurts. They vandalized, they took everything. They really trashed the store. That was about 4 o'clock this morning, I came down. All the merchandise was taken. Bars were broken, windows were broken. So they took things out, everything out. How do you feel about that? Right now, I'm numb. Put the fire out! Put the fire out! Put the fire out! Business after business after business was helpless to stop the onslaught. If it wasn't looters, it was fire that shut them down. Fire after fire after fire kept breaking out all over the city, primarily in businesses and businesses which probably will not be able to reestablish themselves once the riot is over. This is an extended edition of the morning show and front page. We feel the community needs this. A local radio station owned by Stevie Wonder fielded a full day of calls as people tried vainly to make sense of what was going on. Come on, what are we doing to our community? Outside, now brazen looters attacked commerce at will, bank teller machines included. Excuse me, what are you taking out of that? <laughs> <laughs> What do you got? What do you take? Is this your store? <laughs> Sir, just behind you, there are a dozen people looting the shop. What's going on? No, those are all the owners over there. They're repairing all that stuff. Talking about back, back here? Yeah. yeah, they're all owners there. They are all owners. Yeah, we're already over there. But in a sea of chaos, smoke, and looting, Charles Jones's store is an island. Oh, there's tension and violence here, too. Outside, in fact, a man was shot to death in his car. Was that related to the riot, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Because it was a Korean man driving down the street. And uh, they shot him. But inside, Charles and his son Michael try to do business, if not as usual, as close as they can get. See, because you burn me down, I've got six other families that are dependent upon me, people that work for me. You burn down um, Harriet's beauty shop. She's got some operators in there. They out of work. See? And the residual effect isn't going to be felt until it's payday. We're standing in Midtown Los Angeles now, several miles from South Central LA, the core of this whole problem and where things started. And as you can see, See behind me, the building is engulfed in flames. There are no firefighters around anywhere. It's a situation that's on almost every block. The firefighters can't even begin to answer all the needs. The fire department received more than 3,000 emergency calls by early this morning. But with hundreds of blazes, firefighters were a bit overwhelmed. Number one, it's ridiculous what's going on. Number two, it's tough for us to do the job the way we're trained to do it because we're spread so thin. Captain Kephart has been on the job since the riots began. He says there were very few victories as arsonists blackened the city. Well, a lot of guys here are going to see more fires today and tonight than they've seen in 10 years. We've been, we've fought four fires already in uh, four and a half, five hours. So it's crazy. But that's not all that's crazy. Firefighters, usually seen as the Red Cross of Flames, have become the target of violence, even though they obviously had nothing to do with the Rodney King verdict. Still, they've been besieged by rocks and bottles and, in some cases, gunshots. It's the first time in 14 and a half years that I've never felt like we've always been the good guys. People always want to... It's the first time in my career that I've ever felt like 
a lot of these people aren't happy to see us here, and that's unfortunate. As many as a thousand fires ravaged areas of Los Angeles, and dark plumes of smoke striped the sky a whiskey brown. Travelers flying into the city could see smoke as far as 70 miles away. Battalion Chief Duncan Baird shook his head in disbelief as he surveyed some of the damage. Targets included furniture stores and corner delis, markets and video shops. The fires quickly spread to homes. I'm guessing there's probably 30 or 40 apartments in there, and those people are going to be out of, out of a home, and it's really sad. And as one of the structures collapsed, Baird seemed resigned to the partial futility of it all. This building's going to probably going to burn to the ground. If and when it does or we're able to put the fire out, then we'll just have to move on. We'll be reassigned to another fire somewhere else. Many of those fighting the flames are longtime veterans of the department, men like Battalion Chief John Gamret, who fought fires during the Watts riot in 1965. Well, I was here during the original Watts riots, and it's much worse now. I think more structures are burned, it's more widespread, there's more looting, and there's more hostility. And how is Gamera dealing with the overwhelming situation? Well, it's just uh, part of the job. It's just something you have to do, and you try to isolate yourself. What's going on right now isn't right. 36 teams of firefighters from cities around California were en route to help the county's 1,700 firefighters. But that news didn't seem to bolster the exhausted troops. It's a holocaust. That's, that's all you can say. Hopefully it won't last long.